that it risks, right? It's called letting the land lay fallow. And it gives the land a chance to regroup. Um, uh, if you need a rest, and if you need a day of rest every now and then, certainly the land does as well. It, <coughs> uh, the way to get helpful crops. How many of you know that uh, there are three different lectionary cycles? There's A, B, and C. And they follow one on top of the other. So in the, in the lectionary, the Bible readings for the day and for the week and for the year, they're all laid out. And uh, in the church, we generally follow those. For instance, the scripture that was just read is for today. And there are so many different churches throughout the world that are reading those scriptures on this day. They come from the lectionary. Well, I've been a United Methodist using the lectionary those readings for the past almost 15 years. That means I've been through the cycle five times. The three-year cycle, 15 years, is five different times I've been through these same readings, and my sermons have come largely from those readings. Well, uh, I think it's time to let Russell lay fallow for a little while, the lectionary anyway, lay fallow. And so I've decided to do a series of messages that are not connected with the lectionary. They are connected to something other than that lectionary cycle. They're connected to my life cycle. Uh, and why I say this is I'm going back to uh, the time when I first uh, came to know Christ, when I was really just a young boy. And uh, when I received my very first copy of God's Word, it was from my parents. And on the flyleaf, my mother wrote these words, says, Christmas 1958, love mom and dad. And underneath was written the scripture reference, 2 Timothy 2.15. And that's the text I want to come to you. And for the next probably six months, uh, I'm going to let the lectionary lay fallow. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to the scriptures that have meant so much to me in my life. Uh, sometimes it will be just one verse. Other times it will be three or four verses. But these are not just my texts, these are our texts, because most of these you will have heard many times, because there are a lot of people's favorite texts. As a matter of fact, I looked up, I did a Google search on what are the most popular or the most read Bible verses. And many of the ones that I had already picked out were on that list. And so I, I dare say that as we go through this list, maybe 20, 25, Maybe a few will hop out, maybe a few will, more will hop in. Whatever it might be, the next six months or so, we're going to be focusing <coughs> on really familiar texts. And I'm going to try to uh, see if the little places, the little blind spots that some of us may have in these texts can be brought to light. For instance, uh, you know, there's, there's the guy who... Uh, decided that the best way to read the Bible was to uh, flip it open, you know. Uh, none of this uh, systematic reading for him. Every time he's just going to flip it open to any spot and read the verse. Well, the first night he did that, he flipped it open and came right to the gospel and, and uh, where he pointed his finger, he read and said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. Uh, well, he said, no, nah, I I must have done something wrong. So he closed it, he opened it, it flipped it open again, and it was almost the same chapter, and it says, go thou do likewise. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're not going to be like that, all right? Uh, but by the same token, it's good. Uh, you know, if, you, if, if we misunderstand a basic thrust of a text, even though it's a familiar text, and especially if it's a familiar text, we can, uh, we can set our life's compass in the wrong direction, can't we? And so, uh, I want you to pray with me that uh, I'll be faithful to God's Word as I preach these texts to you the next uh, number of months. This scripture verse, as I said, became my life's verse. How many of you have a life's verse? Where, you know, if somebody said, what's the most important verse to you in the Bible, what would you say? John 3, 6, Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. There's uh, more than a few people that will have that one as their, as their life's verse. Why? Because it speaks to the basic need we all have, the salvation, right? Okay. Anybody else? 
I've already bared my soul, you know, 2 Timothy 2.15, that's my favorite. Okay. A lifelong love affair between my heart and 2 Timothy 2.15. This is a contemporary version of New Revised Standard. Do your best to present yourself to God. To present yourself to God. Get that picture, that word picture in your mind now. Here you are, and you're lifting yourself up to God. Present yourself to God as one approved by Him. A worker who has, and that doesn't mean that you have to be a preacher, but just somebody who loves Him and will do what He's asked you to do. How many of you had a parent that asked you to do something at least once in your life? Or told you to do something at least once in your life? Right? This is what we're talking about. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining or handling the word of truth. In the King James Version, it says rightly dividing the word of truth. Dividing means to what? To uh, uh, portion out correctly. Rightly dividing. Godly excellence is what we're talking about here. That is the right handling or the right explaining, the right dividing of God's Word. The idea of handling is, again, that it, rightly dividing the Word of God is a picture of a father dividing up the apple pie at, at, at the table. You're making sure every member of the family gets a slice and it's an equal or proportionate slice. Now listen, that was an activity that was very closely watched at the house in which I was raised, especially when my brother, I mean, my brother was a lot bigger than me and he still is and, you know, he's how does this work? He's a lot skinnier than I am. He's bigger and he's also skinnier. Some things are just not fair. Anyway, excellence in the handling of God's Word comes from a commitment to learning and rightly using His Word. Vince Lombardi is uh, obviously from the world of football, uh, a great leader, a uh, very successful football coach back in the 19th 50s, uh, led the Green Bay Packers to the first two Super Bowl championships. And uh, he said this, he said, the quality of a man's life is in direct proportion to his commitment to excellence, regardless of his chosen field or endeavor. I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, his greatest fulfillment to all he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. That's a great quote from a secular standpoint of view. That's the positive thinking, uh, and that is the positive acting on <coughs> positive thinking. That's, in, a, in short, don't leave anything on the field. I mean, just lay it all out there. Don't take anything away from it. Lay it all out there. Don't, don't hold back anything. And, Applying it to 2 Timothy 2.15, the worker that is approved to God, the person who is approved to God, is the one who doesn't leave anything held back from serving God. Gives it all. Gives himself to excellence. So, what I want to do with these few moments that we have is to talk about with you... Um, the vessels of which God approves, those who are prepared and pure and powerful vessels. Those are the three words that you're filling in the lines this morning. We want to talk about being a prepared vessel. We want to talk about being a pure vessel and a powerful vessel, one of which there is no shame and can stand before God totally approved. A prepared vessel is one of which God's, God approves and, and, and can stand before Him in service unashamed. The word approved there is a term that comes out of the banking industry and it means to be tested and found worthy. If you go into a store and you hand them a $20 bill or anything larger than that, what are they going to do with it? They're going to look at it closely, won't they? They've got these special pens that they swipe on there and you know, it tells whether it's an, you know, a counterfeit or if it's real. I don't know how the pen works, but it's, uh, it's like that. The word approved here means to be tested and found genuine, not counterfeit. The question that I have for us, I think that the Bible has for us, about
about being a prepared vessel, one that's going to be the kind of person that God looks at and says, that's a genuine, that's not a counterfeit. To be a prepared vessel, uh, how do you get there? How do you become God's worthy workman? Well, I want to give you three characteristics within this idea of being prepared. Preparation means and begins with knowledge. It begins with uh, understanding. Our business is to gain the kind of knowledge that we need to be God's workers. And that comes primarily from the Word of God. You remember the illustration I gave the children this morning of the little manual for my saw. Okay? Uh, I should not ever have turned that saw on until I opened that manual and started reading, right? And, and I mean, if, if something has an electric cord, you know where that goes, but you know, uh, the rest of the stuff, you know, there's some things. Well, we know because our parents told us, perhaps, or, you know, you heard it in church, you ought to read the Bible. You ought to, you ought to start preparing yourself for whatever God has for you. And in such a world as we live, which is a world of darkness, only the light of the truth of God's Word will do. You can never honor God as a prepared servant, a prepared vessel, if you will not study the Word of God. You know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of you folks because in all the churches that I've served, nine in all as a pastor over the last 40 years, I think that your consistency in Bible study every single week just absolutely is the best that I have seen in terms of a percentage of a congregation where they come to Bible study as well as worship. And I, you know what, I, I'm not blowing smoke here. I'm not just trying to pat you on the back. The, and the reason that I highlight this is because you've been busy preparing yourselves with God's Word. You talk about God's Word in the Bible study on Sunday mornings. You do that to prepare your soul, to prepare your minds, your hearts, everything about you. And that stands out to me as a pastor because I've seen folks who don't have a, an appetite for Bible study and somehow it rings hollow when they talk about being a true worshiper of God. You can never honor God unless you prepare yourself with the Word of God and you can never prepare yourself unless you study it. Folks, it is good to read it. It is, by light years, better to study it. And then preparation, besides meaning knowledge, it also develops a knack. Just like a carpenter will develop skill with his tools. That's what I'm trying to do with my new saw. Uh, you know, I wasn't very good when I first started using it. I'm still not very skilled because I've only had two days with the thing. But listen, I intend to get better. How am I going to get better? I'm going to continue to read that manual. I'm going to read it back and forth a couple of times. And I'm going to pick up on the things maybe I've missed. But I'm going to continue to use it. And that's how we become uh, proficient. That's how we develop a knack for using God's Word. There are a lot of people that read God's Word and their mind is already made up as to what a verse means, especially a familiar verse. But listen, how are you going to learn if you don't allow God to speak to your heart? You know, the writer of the manual of my little saw there had certain things in mind when they wrote down what to do and what not to do and the tips on how to use that thing. He wanted to get to me that these are the most important things. This is what you need to listen to. And this is how developing a knack for using God's Word. It's God who has to teach you the knack of using His Word properly. So we have preparation, meaning that we gain knowledge. Secondly, that we develop knack. Thirdly, it begins on the knee. It means that we pray. Submission to God and His Word and complete allegiance to Him as Lord does not just mean bowing the knee in prayer. What it means is bowing the life in surrender. It means committing yourself to what God's Word says. It means that when you read something like the tithe is holy and belongs to the Lord. You don't just look at it and say, yeah, that's right. And then go ahead and give 1%. Or skip the offering altogether. Now listen, this is not a sermon on tithing. That's an illustration. I was convicted. I was stopped dead in my tracks not too long ago when I realized that uh, there are certain parts of my income. I got, you know, 
Did you ever get in a rut? Did, did you ever get in a rut doing something where, oh yeah, I gotta do this, and so you, you do it, bang, you do it the same as you did the last time, and the time before that, and the time before, and the time of the, because it's a habit. But a habit, if you do it without thinking on a regular basis why you're doing it, a habit becomes a rut, and you're stuck in it. And I was stuck thinking that I was tithing, and in reality, I had missed certain parts of my hand, and I thought to myself, I could do something about that. You know, I've, I've gotten so used to being taken to the woodshed for the times that I've, I have done things by omission, not commission, but omission. I just missed it. Is that ever happened to you? I know it never happens to you. I mean, stuff just goes right over your head like that. It happens to me a lot. I just miss things. A prepared vessel is a vessel that is surrendered into the hands of the great potter and pays attention to what God's word is saying. Now, that's a prepared vessel. God likes people who take their Christian commitment seriously. Then God also approves a vessel that is pure. There's some timeless truths that we can learn from God's word here. And uh, I want to investigate a little bit of what Paul told his young protege, Timothy. Timothy was a young man, and he was put in charge of a church by Paul. Paul laid hands on him and says, all right, now you are the pastor of that church over there. When I leave town, you're going to pastor that church. And Timothy got intimidated. He was a little nervous about pastoring all those, you know, older people who were wiser than he was. Paul told him what? Don't let anybody look down their nose at you. Timothy, you've had a spirit of God placed in you. You have been ordained to this particular church. And uh, remember what Paul said about Timothy and his grandmother and mother, Lois and Eunice? Paul said, I, I see the same spirit in you that dwelt in your mother and your grandmother, Lois and Eunice. They, those two women were Paul's greatest helper in that location. And that's perhaps why he chose Timothy. He saw the same kind of of heart for God in Timothy that could develop into a good pastor. And so he put him in charge. And Paul told him a few things. And we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. I'll read that in a moment. But he told him basically two things here. He told him, first of all, that the mouth reflects the heart. You remember what Jesus said about the heart? The mouth only reflects what is actually in the heart. And so what comes out of the mouth, you can pretty much sure that's what's in the heart. Now that's, that's an important thing. Paul tells Timothy to avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it are going to become more and more ungodly. Their teaching spreads like gangrene. Paul mentioned to Timothy about Hermanius and Philetus. Two men who had wandered away from the truth of God, they thought that the resurrection had already taken place, and they destroyed the faith of some people in the church. Jesus laid down this principle in Mark chapter 15 that whatever comes out of the mouth simply reveals what the heart is like. Hymenaeus and Philetus taught an erroneous view of the resurrection. Their view of the afterlife is that it was a myth. And that if you're going to have any pleasure, if you're going to have any good stuff in your life, you better grab it now because once you're dead, that is it. You go in the grave, you rot, and that's all there is to it. Now to Paul, these false chatterboxes were to a church what gangrene is to a leg wound. The mouth reflects the heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. The Lord knows those who are his. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, which are precious, but also of wooden clay, not so precious. Some are for noble purposes and some not so noble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, the not so noble, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Paul is pointing to God in this, and he's saying this, if God wants you to do good stuff with your life, you've got to avoid the bad stuff. You've got to avoid extraneous stuff. John Wesley, in one of his instructions to the would-be preachers, said, 
do not be underemployed. He said, don't be <coughs> worthlessly employed. What he meant was this. Whatever you're doing, especially if it's for the Lord, make sure it's going to count. Make sure that it is good stuff. But Paul went a little bit further, and Paul said that the mouth, if it is not cleansed, is like gangrene, but he said it can be cleansed if the heart is cleansed. Here's a poll that we need to take. How many of you that sin believe that sin, how many of you sin? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I don't have to. <clears throat> Paul is saying that uh, sin begins somewhere. How many of us believe that sin begins with what we do? Where does sin begin? It does begin with the heart, doesn't it? What we do is like the mouth. What we do, those things that we do that are sinful things, those are just a reflection of what is actually in the heart. For instance, if if I just slowly backed up to the altar right now, why you couldn't notice me, I just reached behind and grabbed a bunch of that money off the Lord's supper table and stuffed it in my pocket, and none of you would have seen me, right? <clears throat> that action is sinful, but what does it reveal about us? Greed in the heart, right? I don't care what God's people need. I don't care what that family in Bennett needs. I want. My <laughs> sin began in the heart, not with what I did. It was my heart that drove me to do these things. So, the mouth can be cleansed if the heart is cleansed. And the heart can only be cleansed in one way, and that's with confession. True, heartfelt con confession. And that's what empties a heart of a sin that's there, <coughs> the forgiveness that we live in. But there's a caution in this. When we have our hearts cleansed of sin, what does it create? It creates a vacuum. We need to be careful not to stay empty in our hearts. You do very well to confess sin and be done with it, but remember that in nature, which often uh, parallels the spiritual realm, in nature, a vacuum is at work. How many of you have ever opened a can of peanuts or a, a, a can of soda? What's the, what's the sound that you hear? Come on, make the sound. You girls know the sound. What does it sound like? Right. Is the opening. What happens after the opening? Thank you. Somebody said it. That's the sound, right? The air is what? Escaping, right? Ah, the air is not escaping. The air is being sucked in. Why? Because there was a vacuum there. What happens? How many of you can vegetables? What happens when you tighten that lid and that lid warms inside there? What, what happens? It creates a vacuum. And so what happens, you know, when that top goes down, you know that that thing is sealed and it's going to stay fresh, right? What happens when you open it up? The top pops. Why? It's because the vacuum that was in there has been broken and the air rushes in. Listen, it's the same in the spiritual life. When you ask God to forgive you, what does the scripture say? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He removes every stain. He removes every part of the sin from your heart where it started. But does he put anything in there without us asking for it? <coughs> I want to suggest to you that he doesn't. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 12 about the woman sweeping the house clean. She swept her house clean. And he likened it to a man who had a demon inside of him. The demon was cleansed from him. 
And what happened was the person went about his life as if, uh, oh, it's wonderful, a demon has been taken from me. He went around with an empty heart. He went around with an empty spirit. What happened? That demon left and went and found seven of his friends and brought them back and jumped on the man again. And his time was seven times worse than it was before. Now listen, I don't, this is not a treatise on, on uh, demons and, and angels and stuff like that. But the parable that Jesus told about this, the teaching that Jesus gave was, once your heart has been cleansed from sin, once you've asked Jesus in, to leave your heart in an empty condition does what? It invites spiritual disaster. If you do nothing about it, what's the thing to do next? It isn't enough to empty of sin in confession, living the spirit-filled life. What's the second word of that phrase? Spirit-filled life? Is that the spirit fill you? No vacuum. It's useless to prepare the vessel to surrender to God, to purify the vessel in confession of sin. It's useless unless you allow the Spirit to fill you. And then He can make you a powerful vessel. How does that happen? How are you feeling? How are you useful? Paul talked about several things to pursue. He said to pursue righteousness and faith and love. He said, Put aside and flee from the youthful uh, indiscretions, the impatience, the greed, the anger, the lust that wants to take over our lives and pursue righteousness and faith and love. This is how we invite the Spirit into our life. Righteousness shows up in kindness and gentleness towards people. Faith evidences itself in patience and unselfishness. Love is revealed when one lays down his life for another. So how are you doing with handling rightly the word of truth? <clears throat> By way of illustration, I'll tell you a little story to close this thing. Um, and this is all about whether or not we're going to remain as empty vessels or spirit-filled vessels. Because it's vitally important for the church. It's vitally important for God's church. Not just Pleasant Hill. Not just Mount Zion. Or this church or that church. It's vitally important for the church. To have God's people filled with the spirit. So that they will be present in the field. Present and rightly dividing the word of truth. For the community. To get to know God. For the spread of his word. Little story. Two lions in the Washington Zoo. Two lions in Washington, D.C., the zoo. Two lions escape the zoo. And they know that in a city like Washington, D.C., they can't, they can't stay there together. And so if they're going to hide, they got to separate. And so they agree that they'll separate, and in a month, to the day they will meet back at the Lincoln Memorial. And so these two lions go about their separate ways, and in a month they come back, they meet, and their appearance is somewhat changed. They left two ordinary average zoo lions. When they come back together, the one is emaciated, he's skinny, he's weak. The other one comes back, he's strong, he's robust, he's obviously eating well. And the skinny lion says, I can't make it out here. I'm going back to the zoo. It's impossible. I hide in the park and I hunt for lunch scraps that people leave. At night, I fight squirrels for peanut shells. I can't make it. But look at you, he says to the fat one. All fat and sassy and sleek and good and robust, healthy looking. Where have you been? The fat lion said, I'm hiding out at the White House. And every other day I eat a cabinet member. And as long as I clean up the mess, nobody seems to notice. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck that one in on me, did it? I'm serious. Bless the toast. Cabinet members that are not missed in the administration 
are no different than Christians who are not missed in the Lord's kingdom, in his service. <laughs> to be a useful vessel in God's kingdom, it requires preparation. It requires staying pure. But it requires <coughs> a kind of purity that depends on the power that is supplied by Christ every single day. Father, we thank you for teaching us these principles. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to continually take in the knowledge of your word so that we can rightly divide it. And in understanding, Lord, that our purity would always be seeking your forgiveness for those things that we have found ourselves doing that we ought not to be doing or found ourselves not doing what we ought to be doing or doing things that we should be doing but doing them without excellence doing them just because it's the heaven father for all of this we need to go outside of ourselves because we don't possess the ability and the power only you do Lord, we need to invite your Holy Spirit to have more control over us every single moment of our lives. Lord, help us to be ever about that business so that on the days when we are missed in the service, we truly are missed. We pray this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would find a hymn number 600 in your hymnal. And when you found that, stick your finger in that page, 600, and turn back just a couple of pages to number 594. There's a prayer, a perfect prayer that I think ends very well. This particular thinking that we've been doing together about inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives. It's on number 594. It is entitled, Come Divine Interpreter. This is a prayer that you can pray when you have... Uh, taking in God's word, that's a good thing. When you have asked God to forgive your sins, that is a great thing. But there's that prayer that needs to come. This is a wonderful prayer for us to pray this morning. Come, divine interpreter, the Holy Spirit of God, come into my life. Make me the powerful servant that you want to make of me. Let's stand together and we'll read it together. Come, divine interpreter. Bring me eyes thy will to read, ears the mystic words to hear, words which did from thee proceed, words that in this bliss in bark, kept in an obedient heart. All who read or hear are blessed, if thy plain commands we do. Of thy kingdom here possessed, thee we shall in glory be. When thou comest on earth to abide, reign triumphant. Sing wonderful words of life. <laughs>
for our souls and for our pathway teaches us which way to go. Invite His Holy Spirit and as you go, shed the light of that Spirit. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.